Well, uh, good evening. It's great to be here for Palm Sunday, and uh, it's great to have you here with us. Uh, just before I begin, uh, a number of people have been asking me how my Tuesday afternoons with the Homicide Squad have been going, and I've got to say that after a, a couple of weeks, uh, it seems to be going a treat. Um, I uh, feel like it's, um, I, I'm much further ahead than expected. I feel like God's really uh, enabling me to connect uh, well with the folks there. Um, these are awesome people. I've been really uh, convicted uh, by God and deeply challenged to pray more for our police, uh, having only spent a few afternoons with these guys. Uh, they're awesome people committed to just outcomes for both victims and perpetrators. And I've been staggered by the loads that these guys are carrying on any given day. Uh, it would be great if we as a people could uphold um, the police in our prayers uh, on any given day. I think that would be a terrific thing for us to do. Last Tuesday, I was on my way back from the Homicide Squad to Sindel on the train, and I assumed that I was on the Glen Waverley line. And uh, I was on the phone at the time, it's true, but the sign, I'm sure the sign said Glen Waverley. Well, I, I might not have been listening to the announcement, okay? But uh, it took me till Camberwell to realise <laughs> that uh, I was on the train to Lilydale, not to Sindel. And uh, that, was where, that was not where I was wanting to go at that time. But there's no turning back, is there, when you're on a train? There's only two choices, either stay on or get off. So I stayed on, then I hopped off at Heatherdale and got Joanne to drive me to Sindel to pick up my car. <laughs> a little embarrassing, but that's how it was. So sometimes, don't we, in life, we start with one destination in mind and we end up somewhere entirely different. It happens with careers. A young graduate begins with all sorts of aspirations and dreams and years later find themselves at a different destination to what they had in mind. It happens with relationships. A couple begin their marriage with happily ever after in mind, but after years of neglect or inconsistency or even trauma from unforeseen events, any couple can find themselves in a different destination, at a different destination to what they had in mind. It happens in business. A number of friends of mine are in high-level management and they find the euphemistically named restructure a nightmare where their staff come into their job one day with a stable job and in an earth-shattering conversation, they're told their services are no longer required. By my friend's reckoning, reckoning, it doesn't seem to matter how much money is in the payout. For many people, the process is super, super distressing because at the end of the day, they find themselves at a different destination to what they had in mind. On Palm Sunday, we see a whole bunch of people, crowds of people, we're told by the Gospels, who start somewhere and they think that they're going to a destination with Jesus. And they're partially right, but the mechanisms to get there and the short-term destination is totally wrong. Sometimes Jesus takes us to, diff to a different destination than what we have in mind. And let's face it, sometimes, there it is, sometimes Jesus takes us to places that we just don't want to go. This evening as we open the word to Palm Sunday and the descriptions thereof in the Gospels, we're going to look at a range of people who think Jesus is taking them to one place, but indeed he's taking them to another. Pretty well everyone in the Palm Sunday crowd, as far as destination is concerned, has something entirely different in mind to what Jesus does. And the one million dollar question is, would we be any different if we were there? If we're to be honest, all of us have a great many destinations in mind for ourselves, destinations for our lives, for our finances, for our families, for our marriages, for our relationships, for our vocation or the work of our hands. But sometimes Jesus takes us to places we don't want to go. 
in the lead up to this Easter this year, I thought it might be helpful to ask how then can we get on board with Jesus' plans rather than being fixated on our own. This evening as we look a little closer to some of the participants in Palm Sunday, my hope is that Jesus will meet us where we're at and invite us afresh to follow him. Before we open the word together though, let us pray. Lord, we uh, come here this evening with lots of bits and pieces on our minds. So many things that we bring in from the week. Little rucksacks full of information and stresses and conflicts and thoughts about work, about study, about a whole range of things. And so, Lord, I'm asking that in amongst the static, in amongst all the thoughts, all the bits and pieces, that you might penetrate all of that, that you might speak into our hearts where we are and that you might bring us closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the first AFL matches I attended was back in the days when it was the VFL and Essendon were at the height of their powers back in the 80s and Richmond had long since become cellar dwellers on the ladder, believe it or not, it's crazy. The game was at Essendon's home ground and Essendon were on top of the ladder and Richmond were on the bottom of the ladder and unexpectedly, Richmond absolutely flogged Essendon that day. And I've got to tell you that at the beginning, the Bomber supporters who were all sweetness and light at the beginning of the match were decidedly less than that by three-quarter time. They booed the umpires, they booed the players, they even booed Kevin Sheedy as he walked onto the ground at three-quarter time. They were filthy. And their own premiership coach was on the receiving end of their yelling and booing. And I've got to tell you, as a Hawthorne supporter, I enjoyed it immensely. It (laughs) It was a spectacle worth showing up for. It's interesting though, isn't it, how quickly the crowd turns when things don't go their way. One minute they're cheering and then the next minute they're booing. Although the tone of the crowds changed significantly over the next few days, on Palm Sunday, the crowd's response to Jesus is one of elation and joy. It's clear that they feel like they're supporting a winning team. And also, they think that Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem to somehow save them from their lot. Have a look at the language and behaviour, and it's that of those who think that they've just joined a winning team. Matthew 21 records it in this way. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches down from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him, Jesus, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna, save us, in the highest heaven. Well, there seems to be solid scholarly consensus about the accounts in all four Gospels of Palm Sunday that the crowds were basically proclaiming Jesus as Messiah and as Saviour and as King. Their language and behaviour, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that tonight, but their language and behaviour is that of a group of people celebrating the entry of a victorious King. Unusually on this occasion, Jesus not only allows the proclamation, but seemingly he plays into it by riding, uh, by what he rides into, he rides into Jerusalem on a cult, the transport of a king, a cult which he specifically asked his disciples to procure for the occasion. The crowd had it so right. Jesus was the Messiah and he would save the world. And the crowd had it so wrong. Far from overthrowing the the Roman government, Jesus would be crucified by them. Hybels and many before him suggest that the only one in the Palm Sunday picture, including the disciples who actually know what is happening and what is going to happen, the only person who knows is actually Jesus. It might surprise you to know that Jesus has seen this kind of fervour before. John records that just after the feeding of the 5,000, the crowds begin to develop their own aspirations for Jesus. 
In John 6, 15, and this is well before Palm Sunday, after the people saw the sign, which is the the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Look at this. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Jesus isn't interested in the kind of king that the crowds want him to be. They want him to be a conquering king, someone who will liberate them from the Romans and bring freedom and prosperity. They want Jesus to be their saviour, but they want it on their terms. I don't know what your prayer life is like, but many, many times mine reads like I'm an advisor rather than a servant. You know, when you, if you look at my prayer journal, many, many times I'm telling God just how he might rule the universe a little better. I'm giving him tips for efficiency, ideas that he may not have considered many times like an advisor rather than a servant. And like the crowds of Palm Sunday, We can cheer wildly if we think that Jesus is the kind of king that we want. Some of us want Jesus to save us in our finances. We give generously, but we wonder what the future might hold. Will we have enough for our mortgage, for our super, for next month's rent? We want him to be our saviour, but we want it on our terms. Some of us want Jesus to save us in our relationships, to provide a spouse, to heal a rift, to shut down an enemy, to calm a conflict, and we want him to be our saviour, but we want it on our terms. All of us want Jesus to save our friends, our family, our siblings, our parents, our children. But for some of us, if we're to be totally honest, we want him to do it our way. We want them to be the same as us. We want them to be respectful and say, you were right all along. We want them to be made in our image if we're to be honest, if totally honest. We want them to be transformed more into our image than into his. We want Jesus to be their saviour, but we want it on our terms. The crowds totally misunderstood Jesus' intent. And let's be honest, they're not the only ones. We've got the whole picture and we still misunderstand him. If we were to do a little survey out in the lobby this evening, and it was someone other than a pastor asking you. And I'm pretty sure if they ask us what we're looking forward to most about Easter, I'm pretty sure that reconnecting with our Saviour will barely rate a mention. It's embarrassing to admit, but I'm as as guilty as anyone else. I'm looking forward to hot cross buns with friends and family. I'm looking forward to some time to chill out down at the beach I'm looking forward to some chocolatey indulgence and I'm looking forward to paddling on the bay. But if I'm totally honest, amongst all the other clutter, Jesus barely rates a mention. As Easter passes us by year on year, the most significant event in history can actually move right past us with barely a thought. Like the crowds on Palm Sunday, we can sing Hosanna and just move right on. And boy, I wish it were not true, but it is, isn't it? We want Jesus to be our saviour, but we want it on our terms. Thankfully, Jesus doesn't follow the voices of the crowds. Jesus is an unconventional king. In an upside down and inside out move, Jesus becomes powerful by becoming powerless. He defeats darkness and sin, not by eliminating it, but by entering it and being crushed by it. Isaiah says it well. Isaiah says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we're healed. Jesus is an unconventional king. The nature and purpose of Jesus is easy to miss if you're not looking for it. And in their desire for a saviour of their own making, the crowds missed some really critical facts about Jesus. Firstly, the type of animal that he's riding. It indicated what kind of king he was. An unridden foal of a donkey is the transport of a humble king bringing peace, not a conquering king bringing war. 
no chariots, no armed escort, no security detail, just Jesus on an unridden foal of a donkey, a humble king who came to serve the least of these. Closer examination would have shown that Jesus had no intention at all of conquering anyone by conventional means. Jesus is an unconventional king. And in the immortal words of S.M. Lockeridge, I wonder, do you know him? The crowds also failed to notice who Jesus kept company with. Jesus was totally socially unacceptable at so many levels. If Jesus was a conquering king, naturally you would think he'd gravitate towards the powerful and the popular and the rich and the famous. seems that none of them were on Jesus' agenda. One of his inner team was a tax collector, one of the most despised and hated people in Jesus' context, and he's in the team. Not only this, Jesus hung out with all the wrong kinds of people, social outcasts and misfits. From tax collectors to prostitutes, Jesus had collected a pretty seedy band of followers by the time he's done. Jesus didn't just hang out with unsavory types. He often rejected the squeaky clean, and that's the, that's the rub right there. He often rejected the squeaky clean religious ones. Luke records that Jesus once had a respected and wealthy ruler asked to join his team and told him to go and sell all his possessions and give the proceeds to the poor, and the rich man went away sad. Closer examination would have shown that Jesus, far from being an astute social climber, lived by his very own principle, whoever wants to be great must be servant of all. And for Jesus, all means all. Jesus is an unconventional king. I wonder, do you know him? Finally, the crowds failed to notice how politically incorrect Jesus was. As a conquering king, it would have been a good idea to make sure that he had all the powerful political and religious groups on site. Make sure all the key players and all the main guys were well and truly on his team. After all, a conquering king needs a political support of others to win the day, right? Didn't, isn't that what they need? Contrary to the best political advice, Jesus always seemed to be picking fights with all the wrong kinds of people. He publicly flouted religious rules, often to serve the sick and the marginalised. He roundly condemned the religious, powerful religious elite. He sent the wealthy to sell all their possessions. He He chased the people with commercial interests out of the temple. Closer examination would have shown that Jesus ran to God's agenda not his own or anyone else's. And later in the week, he'd be heard to utter a prayer that would echo down the ages. Not my will, but yours be done. Jesus is an unconventional king. I wonder, do you know him? It might surprise you to know, but among the crowds that day, there were those who did know him intimately. Even though they knew him intimately, they still didn't know how this is going to end. And we really don't know what the disciples thought, but Luke tells us that they were absolutely swept up in the festivities. When he came near a place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, Luke tells us the whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God in loud voices. We did it tonight. There's nothing wrong with that. It's all good. So the disciples are involved as well, and surely their celebration is much more nuanced than the crowds around them. They're singing, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, because they've walked the road with him, and they understand that his role and the future, his future as a suffering king, right? They've literally heard Jesus speak of his upcoming death and resurrection, of his suffering and humiliation, and ultimately his triumphant resurrection, so they know what's coming, right? Wrong. Have a look at how the verse ends. The whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. That's past tense. These guys have got no idea where Jesus is going to lead them in the next weeks. All we know by their reasoning is that the disciples are in so far. Praising God for all the miracles that they had seen 
so far. What we know is that by the week's end, this group of disciples would be in utter and total disarray. One would betray Jesus to death, one would deny he even knew him, and the rest would run away. And during the next few days, Jesus' unconventional ways would test his disciples to the limit. In between the Last Supper and the Garden of Gethsemane, there's an incredibly poignant conversation between Jesus and his disciples where he spells out the torrid times that are going to be coming their way. He tells them of his, his impending death. He tells them that it's going to go badly. He tells them that he's going to be resurrected on the third day and to meet him in Galilee after he's risen. And when he's told them that all this is going to happen, this is Matthew's snapshot of the last part of the conversation. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you'll disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Poor old Peter. In retrospect, this just looks like a slow mo train wreck, doesn't it? Don't say it, Peter. Do not make promises you can't keep. Even if I have to die with you, I'll never disown you. Man, that statement would have hunted Peter down in his sleep for years to come. But a word in his defense, verse 35 isn't finished yet. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. We often make an example of Peter, don't we? But when they come to get Jesus, Peter is the only one swinging a sword in his defence. You know, we find out in the Gospels that, that one of the disciples, and we find out that it's Peter, was swinging a sword and he takes off the ear of the servant of the high priest. And it sort of sounds like he's sort of deftly whipped his ear off. No, nah, he, he, he's a fisherman. He's probably going for the whole head, I suspect. He's having a dip. He's trying to defend his Lord and Saviour. He's trying to help in any way he can. And Jesus says, no, that's not the way we're going to fly. We often make an example of him. So when he's standing in the courtyard and where he denies that he knows Jesus, there's only one other disciple around, and that's John. So where are the rest? See, Peter wasn't the only one who behaved shamefully on that night. You can disown Jesus with your words, but let's be honest here, you can disown Jesus with your actions also. Peter might have been out of his depth, but at least he tried to follow. The disciples are different to the crowds, not because they understand where Jesus is taking them and not because they're awesome all of the time. I just want to be real clear on that tonight. The crowds on Palm Sunday sang their hosannas. They paid their homage, waved their palm fronds in the air in worship to the king, and within a week they'd clearly moved on. What sets the disciples apart is that good, bad, or ugly, they keep following. Through the desolation of the crucifixion, through the anguish of the silence of Saturday, and in the joyous resurrection of Sunday, and later the explosive beginnings of Pentecost, the disciples never move on from Jesus. They keep on following. And now question of the week. How about you? What does it take to knock you off your game? The song we're going to finish with this evening has a little bridge in it that came from an old hymn from the 60s. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. The story of the hymn apparently originated in India where a man along with his family decided to follow Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour and called to renounce their faith by the village chief. The convert declared, I have decided to follow Jesus. The declaration cost all of them, him, his wife, his children, cost them their lives. But their unyielding display of faith is reported to have led to the conversion of the chief of the village and many, many others 
in the village. It's a grisly story. And although Christians are continuing to be persecuted world over, this story is so far from our reality here in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, isn't it? It's so far removed from where we are. But I want to say this evening, you don't need the threat of death to make it difficult to follow Jesus. I reckon following Jesus, good, bad or ugly, in our context, often looks like this. I was out on the bay a a, a while back and it was hazy and you just couldn't see the horizon. When it's like that, you move in faith. You move with the vision you have. You move with the light that you've got. That's exactly what the disciples did. They followed with the vision that was available to them. They couldn't, could barely see an inch in front of them at times. Many times following Jesus simply means we don't get to see what's on the horizon. Sometimes it's because of fog. Sometimes it's because we're about to go around a blind corner and we're faced with a choice. We can stop or we can keep following. This Palm Sunday, we can get carried away with palm branches or hosannas, but we can also quietly, in celebration of the king, just take the next step. What's the next step for you? Maybe you've stopped following. Maybe you've stopped and you need to start again. The interesting thing about stopping is that it's almost impossible for others to tell that you've stopped in real time because it begins internally. So you can have switched your heart and mind off to Jesus and stop following, still show up week after week after week, and no one's going to know. It takes a while to actually have any signs that you have. It begins internally. Maybe bitterness or unforgiveness or hurt or even disappointment with God or others, whatever the case may be, you know, at some point you've parked your faith. Perhaps it's time to pick it up again, not with a big showy response or a wild promise like Peter's, even though others fall away, I never will. Just as a quiet step in your heart saying, I have decided to follow Jesus right here right now. Maybe it's about ownership for you. You need to own your faith. Perhaps listening to Maddie this evening as she shared about her workplace, you're thinking, oh my goodness, I could never do that in a million years. And perhaps you need to follow Jesus more clearly at your place of work or in amongst your family or friends or peers. Some days you feel like Peter denying you're a follower or some days your faith is so Far from your actions, no one would ever know. Perhaps you need to tell someone you go to church or that you're a Christian, not loudly or in an awkward kind of a way, just as a quiet step, a way of saying, I have decided to follow Jesus. It could be for some of us that it's about following Jesus in sacrificial love. He gave his life for us, but so often we choke on so much less, don't we? Perhaps he's invited you to stretch out financially or in your use of time to serve or to give so that others might receive, but it feels too hard. You can't see the horizon. Do you have enough, enough time, enough resource? Maybe it's time to simply begin, take a step, not in a loud burst of compulsive fervor, but just a quiet step a way of quietly saying, I have decided to follow Jesus. I know that there will be some of you here this evening that are in a total fog, filled with fear and thinking, if only my next step were that clear, Chris. In the fog of your circumstances, it's hard to hear the voice of Jesus, there seems to be barely enough light to take the next step. 
You know what? That's when this song is at its cracking best. When we're up to our armpits in uncertainty and when we do not know which way is up. The next step could be as simple as crying out to Jesus and having the courage to come and ask someone to pray for you in your fog. It's not that big a thing to do to just ask someone to pray for you. But this Palm Sunday, that could be your quiet step. Just ask someone to pray for you in your fog. It could be a way of saying, I have decided to follow Jesus. You know, we're going to sing that song in a minute and I'm going to ask the band to come up and uh, we'll be singing that right away. But we're going to pray first. We're going to offer ourselves to God and give him an opportunity to help us take the next step. Let's pray together. And so you might like to, in your heart, Take a look at the obstacles to taking that next step, whether it's fear, whether it's embarrassment, whatever it is that is getting in the way of you taking that next step. Why don't you grab that and bring that before Jesus right now? And in your heart, why don't you say, To him, I have decided to follow you, Jesus. Lord, when we hear stories of people who gladly give up their life for you, it embarrasses us, it makes us feel small. But when we see the disciples scattering for cover, denying they know you and acting in embarrassingly bad ways, we take courage. We know that you can use anyone. So, Lord, we ask for resolve this evening. We ask for resolve and for courage to take the next step. Hear our prayer, Lord, as we offer ourselves to you afresh and as we commit to take that very next step. In Jesus' name, amen.